Uh, my name is Veronica Obregón Perco, and I am a scientific advisor with informatics at BD Biosciences. I'm primarily offering support in Flojo software for single cell analysis, which is what we'll be talking about today. Um, so the theme of today's webinar is going to be how to think about or execute a high parameter workflow in Flojo software. Okay, so we'll spend about half our time in the slide deck introducing tools and theory and concept behind high parameter workflows. And then the rest of the time I'll spend in the software doing um, you know, a demo, um, going at about a demo pace. Um, so you know, if you're trying to follow along, you can re-watch this recording at a later time, but I'll mostly be going at a, a pace to show you where all the main features are um, rather than kind of a step-by-step -step tutorial. Um, but, um, you know, as I'll mention at the end of the slide deck, we have tons of learning resources and publications to help you recapitulate these workflows as you go practicing them on your own. So a couple of housekeeping things. Um, if at any point you have a question during the webinar, I don't believe you have an ability to unmute. Um, so what you can do is post your question in the chat box. Uh, you could also use the Q&A box, though. I'm not sure if I'm able to see it when I'm screen sharing. So the chat might be a safer choice, but I'll try to keep a, an eye on the Q&A box as well. So feel free to ask questions as they come up. You don't have to wait till the end of the presentation. Um, second is this session is being recorded, so I will show you where you can access this recording as well as the library of all of our other recordings that we do for all of our live webinars. And that includes everything from intro to Flojo all the way to more advanced topics. Um, last but not least, here is my email address. If you think of any questions after today's session or need any more clarity on some of the features that we're going through, um, don't hesitate to send me an email. I'm always happy to answer questions. And I can also connect you with your um, local scientific advisor in case you need any um, in-person support. Um, and also I could try to find someone closer to your time zone in case the time zones don't always align. Okay, so that being said, let's go ahead and talk today about a high parameter workflow in Flojo software. I'll also mention that my team and I are trying to incorporate different tools that we spotlight in our presentations. Um, there's going to be a lot of different high parameter workflows in our webinar library and also that are upcoming scheduled. Um, and we're trying to take a moment to maybe spotlight one or two tools um, so that each of them gets an opportunity to be described in a little more detail. Um, whereas most of the time we try to talk about all of them very quickly, um, we can kind of give each one its turn to um, have the audience learn a little bit more about that tool and why it might be important in a high parameter workflow. So the two tools I chose to focus on today, so you'll get an extra spotlight slide or two on these, um, will be the FlowSum tool for clustering and EmbedSum for data visualization. Okay, so I'll still mention the others that we have available, but these will just be kind of spotlighted a little bit, and they're the ones that I will use in the demo as well. So why think about a special kind of workflow when we think about high parameter data. I think as flow cytometrists, we're very comfortable with doing a traditional manual analysis, or we have a hypothesis driven population hierarchy that we have to execute based on known phenotypes in the literature. I know that I have to gate down to CD3 before I can look for T cells and maybe along the way exclude B cells and K cells. And then with a different combination of memory markers, I get to my different um, T cell memory subsets. Okay, so that's you know a traditional approach to flow cytometry. Uh, but the reality is that flow cytometry experiments are getting big, right? And this can be both in the number of markers we're measuring in a single moment in time and how many samples we have to analyze at any given moment. So just to give you an idea of how big and complex these panels are getting, I put two published panels for NK cells here. This is an OMIP, which is a published peer review panel, 14 color NK panel. So you can see after about a dozen gates or so, it's not hard to basically identify every possible phenotype that could be found with this combination of markers. But now there's OMIP70, which is a 27 color NK panel, just NK panels alone, right? So no other major lineages in there. So even after I find some of these major NK cell subsets, the rest of the panel is pretty much dedicated towards the expression of various activation markers, um, inhibition markers, uh, migratory markers, and 
a lot of them are not going to be expressed in isolation. You're going to have double positive, triple positive cells, so a lot of complex combinatorial phenotypes. So this is already going to be challenging to tackle with a manual approach, largely just because of the amount of time it's going to take. And then also, we used to think of our flow data in the context of you know, a single fax tube or a handful of fax tubes, but we can acquire whole plates of samples now in a more high throughput analysis. So we've got more markers, more samples, and in addition to just the time investment to analyze data of this nature, there's also the fact that it doesn't lend itself well to a discovery-based approach. We could have a large panel just because we're looking for major lineages and we don't want to waste cells on multiple panels, right? That's a use case that can happen. But I think a lot of the time we design a large panel because we don't really know what we're looking for yet. We have a hypothesis of a marker that might be associated with some kind of a clinical outcome or something like that. Um, but we don't know which marker is going to be you know, the biomarker for that outcome. So we're essentially designing a big panel to discover something new about our research. And because we're doing something of this fishing expedition, you don't know what you're looking for. So how can you gate what you don't know you're looking for, right? So it doesn't lend itself to finding new things unless you have some kind of prior knowledge about what you're looking for. So let me check the chat here. Looks like somebody is having trouble seeing the full screen of the slides, um, but there are a handful of people that say they do see the full screen. So, um, if you're struggling to see the full view, um, perhaps uh, maybe relaunch the Zoom webinar if, um, if possible. I think everybody else is, is able to see it just fine. Okay, so moving on. So what's the other approach, right? So if I'm telling you that a manual analysis is going to you know, possibly be, be a big investment of your time, you might miss rare phenotypes or intermediate phenotypes, then what's the alternative? And I think this is really where computational analysis has started to take off. As our data gets bigger and bigger, um, we're, we're just trying to catch up on the best way to analyze it in an efficient way and um, be able to interpret it right, with the human eye. And so this is really where computational cytometry is starting to have a place. I think that tools like this have always had a place in really large data sets like sequencing, but I think they're becoming more commonplace even in flow cytometry as our panels get bigger and bigger. So what computational analysis allows us to do is somewhat tackle the complexity of a really complex data set um, and also give us an opportunity to have an exploratory analysis. So the two main areas of computational analysis that we'll focus on for most of the presentation is clustering, which allows us to automate population discovery, and dimensionality reduction, which gives us an opportunity to visualize our data in a low dimensional representation. And so your data exists you know, in a, in a high dimensional space that you could turn around sideways and, and see cells arranged by phenotype, but we can't comprehend something like that, um, you know, just on a screen. So with dimensionality reduction, we can kind of lay out all of our data nice and flat and be able to appreciate events that are similar to one another or very distant from one another. So you can see the power of that um, in this example here on the right, where we've got all of these different cell types that are present in a biological sample. And you can see some of these phenotypes are rather complex, or right? you can have um, different combinations of memory markers, um, as well as different combinations of, you know, NK cell markers, things like that. Um, so, you know, having gated something like this manually would have taken quite a, little, a lot of time. And even if you had gated this data manually, to look at all of these individual phenotypes on just a bunch of different biaxial plots um, is really jogging for the mind, and it's hard to quickly spot differences between donors. And so using things like clustering to automate the discovery of these populations, and then dimensionality reduction to see it all at the same time really lets us eyeball differences like this, where I can quickly see that 
there are some differences between these three donors in their frequency of this particular memory subset of CD4 T cells. And something like this is possible with a biaxial plot, but only after I've done all of the manual gating, opened up all of those individual biaxial plots, exported the stats, things like that. So I, this really just gives you a high level view of a complex data set, which we can still go back and confirm you know, with a manual approach. So all in all, we get an opportunity to speed up the identification of populations in our data set. We can visualize them in a single plot and ultimately have an opportunity to get just a thorough assessment of the data and not miss phenotypes or differences that we might have otherwise missed if we were just confined to a manual analysis approach. So to tackle a high parameter workflow, what does a typical one look like in Flojo software? Okay, so this is just a high level view of the steps that we're gonna talk about in this presentation on how to walk through um, a pretty standard high parameter workflow in the software. So it'll begin with a little bit of homework on the files, some pre-processing to prep the data. Then we'll combine all of those files together into a single file, and then they can start to enter these computational tools doesn't really matter if you start with clustering or dimensionality reduction, but you would start with one of these tools, follow up with the other. Okay, so maybe you would start with clustering to identify populations, then choose to visualize them on a dimensionally reduced space. Now, these tools can be used independently, but you can see even from that previous slide the power of using them together because we not only want the populations, but it helps to know which populations have things in common based on their proximity to each other and in the embedding. So after we run these computational tools, we basically spend most of our time in this last step, which is just exploring those populations that have been found, trying to give them some kind of identity, some kind of a phenotype, and then finding differences between our samples, because isn't that what we need at the end of the day, right? We need to know what kind of cell types are unique to a given tissue, like in this example, or what kind of cell types are associated with a favorable clinical outcome. And so we have tools to help you expedite that you know, process of getting some kind of biological discovery. So we'll talk about those as well. So let's first talk about some of the pre-processing that has to happen on these files, right? We can't just take the FCS files right off the cytometer and, and you know, pump them into these pipelines in Flojo software. Right? There's a little bit of cleanup that should be done on these files, um, really just to ensure that you get the best, most reliable results possible. So one of the important aspects really of any flow cytometry experiment, it doesn't just have to be high parameter flow cytometry, is the idea of removing technical anomalies that might ultimately lead to false discoveries. So what do we mean by technical anomalies? These are kind of questionable events that get introduced into the FCS file because of an event that's happened at the cytometer. There could have been a surge in the flow rate, a bubble um, you know, in the line as you're acquiring the sample. One of the lasers or uh, you know, detector arrays was, was kind of unstable in the signal acquisition. And so you get these periods of you know, instability uh, where there might be changes in the fluorescent intensity of a particular marker, but only for a moment in time. But the problem is that these fluctuations in the MFI for a given parameter uh, if they're different enough, they could be recognized by these algorithms as unique populations, but we know that they're actually just artifacts um, based on something that went wrong at the cytometer. So we have whole webinars dedicated on the theme of data quality control and how to clean up your files using automated plugins. So I encourage you to watch those if this is a, a novel topic for you. But just for the sake of this webinar, I'll just say that you know, we want to exclude these periods of instability because we don't want these events messing up our population discovery later down the road. They have traditionally been excluded with something called a time gate, right, where we just draw a manual gate to exclude that. But as these experiments get bigger, we have more parameters, more samples, we can automate that cleanup using algorithms. And we have four available for the use in Flojo. So Flow Clean, Flow AI, Peacock, and Flow Cut. But all of these tools 
are a means to the same end, right? They'll inspect your FCS files, remove these anomalous events, and give you a good, clean subpopulation of good events that you can continue with your manual analysis or your high-parameter workflow. Now, I'll point out that this is not going to replace a traditional manual cleanup of your data, okay? So after you run these tools, you are still going to remove multiplets, remove debris, remove dead cells. Okay, so that's not replacing that. You will still have to do that gating. And then ultimately do that cleanup gating and end up with a nice clean population. It could be as easy as bulk lymphocytes. It could be as granular as CD4 T cells, right? The closer you get to a target population, the more uh, resolution you can get of rare phenotypes, right? Whereas if you want a more uh, global view of your data, then you start higher in your hierarchy and right? put something like lymphocytes into your, your computational workflow. Um, but having something um, with, a, with a bulk uh, population like lymphocytes, if you ultimately have an interest in a really rare Treg, those all those lymphocyte types are going to just wash that population out and it's going to be hard to find it. So if you want to give more attention to rare cell types, you can try to get closer to it with manual gating and then put that maybe ancestral population into your pipeline. Okay? But the main, the main message here is to make sure you run a cleanup tool and do a little bit of manual cleanup to follow up gating to a target population. There we go. So the other thing to think about, not that this is necessarily a requirement for a high parameter workflow, but it is a requirement to do a batch correction before we enter the computational tools like dimensionality reduction and clustering. So I like to have this slide here just because if you are thinking about batch correction, the time to do it would be before you enter dimensionality reduction and clustering. So I like to bring it up here. Um, so why do we worry about things like batch effects? Well, batch effects are basically the results of technical variability. Right? We can have different operators staining our samples. The cytometer might behave differently every time you sit at it. And we do our best to standardize these kinds of things. We standardize our protocols, our reagents, our cytometer, and everything that's going to be an aspect of our experiment. We try to control as best we can. But there are some aspects of variability that are just going to be introduced. Right? There's a lot differences between reagents that are sometimes out of your control. And operators might have a standard operating procedure that they work off of, but maybe one day they let the lysis buffer sit a little too long and now you know some of the fluorochromes have an altered um, spectral profile that day. So I think minimizing batch effects so that we don't get these batch specific differences is, is really the first line of defense. And I think most of the time it works very well, but things can be out of our control, things can go wrong, in which case, right, we don't have to throw the data away. We can take an opportunity to normalize it and correct batch effects using computational solutions. So here's an example of a data set that would be maybe suspicious and that you might have doubts that that you have some you know batch specific uh, events happening in here so for instance if i run a dimensionality reduction on some data and i color code it by batch it would be a little suspicious right if you saw a whole island of cells attributable to a single batch right unless there's something unique about that batch like all of your you know placebo animals are in that batch or something like that um, so it would be suspicious right, to see certain things like that, like a whole island or a whole cell type attributed to only one batch. What ideally we'd want to see is something more like what's on the right, right, where all of the batches are kind of intermingled and you can't really pull out any islands unique to a specific batch. So if you suspect you have something like on the left, right, or like what we're seeing down here in the bottom panel on the left side where we have um, actually, this is the same sample run across different batches, but there's a fluctuation of the CD3 intensity. We can use various batch correction tools to try to alleviate that and normalize those peaks. So we have three of these available in Flojo. Cytonorm is the only one that requires what's called an anchor sample or a reference sample. So that is a sample that you run every single time you're at the cytometer, every single time you stain your cells. And we use it to model batch effects right? every time you acquire an experiment. Not everybody has access to a reference sample, or you might be at the end of your study and now you can't go back and acquire that. There are two other options. 
mutual nearest neighbors, and site combined. These do not require a reference sample. They'll use the bulk data to try to see if there's any batch specific effects. Any tool you use, again, a means to the same end, models the batch effects and either using a reference sample or using all the samples in comparison to each other, applying the normalization to align the peaks, and then it'll either give you new files or new parameters, depending which tool you use. Again, we have whole webinars dedicated to batch correction, but I wanted to just mention here that it is possible and that it's something to think about before you enter your analysis. So last step of the pre-processing um, is really just prepping the files before they enter um, this pipeline, both for the sake of annotation and also making sure we get nice separation of populations or islands in our dimensionality reduction. So the first aspect of this is going to be adding keywords to designate our sample types. So for those of you that have watched any intro to Flojo webinars, we talk about keywords a lot in the context of just adding extra information to your FCS files. So giving a keyword for something like time point and all of your files from time point one would say, you know, day one and all your ones from time point two would say day two for the keyword value. And we can use those to give extra information to our files or use them in batch operations when we're using things like the layout editor or the table editor. But in the context of a high parameter workflow, we're actually using these keywords to be able to tell the files apart after they've been merged together. And also they give us an opportunity to bin similar files into groups. So all of my, as in this example here, all of my blood FCS files will be together. All of my spleen FCS files will be together. And so I can quickly look for differences between the blood and the spleen because all those FCS files have been binned with a single keyword value. So you might be wondering, why do I have to merge the files and then still ultimately have to separate them with keywords. It seems like I'm going a step forward and a step back. Well, the reason we use these keywords right, to annotate the files um, is because we have to merge them. And the reason we have to merge them or concatenate all the files that we ultimately want to compare to one another is because most of these algorithms are fairly stochastic in nature. Stochastic meaning that the results are semi-random. Um, you're not always going to get the same result twice. So if I ran a TISNY four times on the same file, I would get four slightly different looking TISNYs. Now, they're not going to be remarkably different, but there will be some differences. Islands might be in a different location, um, or the TISNY might come out in a different orientation. And so if it's going to look different every time you run it, right? that inherent variability makes it impossible to run it on different files, because how am I going to compare them if the algorithm's already giving me a different TISNY even on the same file? So we kind of circumvent that by putting everything into one file so that they all get the same TISNY calculation or they all get the same clustering output. And then we can just tease apart the merged file into different samples, tissue types, et cetera. Um, so that's the reason that the files ultimately have to be merged um, so that we can circumvent that stochastic nature of these tools. Last but not least, the importance of scaling and transformation on your parameters um, really just can't be said enough. The UMAP and the TISNY or the FLOSIM and the phenograph, they see what you see, right? It's using graph space to ultimately look for visual separation between events. And if there's enough visual separation, then they'll be considered um, you know, different populations. So if we look at the example on the left, right, I've, these two granzyme populations have kind of been compressed. So without even having a scale or FMOs or anything to look at, one could think that these two populations, this granzyme negative and maybe granzyme low, are maybe just the same population. And if I had any positive ones, they'd be over here, but I don't see any. So these are all just the same because there's not much distance between them. But in reality, once I adjust the scale to try to minimize the white space and enhance this visual separation, it's pretty easy to see there's a negative and a positive population. So we want to give these algorithms an opportunity to see this separation between events. Um, and this could be particularly important for dim or you know, kind of rare sporadic markers. So take an opportunity, right? You can do this in your concatenated file that before you enter these pipelines, go through every single parameter, 
and make sure you have nice visual separation and you don't have artifacts like two negative populations or anything like that. Um, we do have some auto scaling tools in our preferences that can help with that. We have some documentation for that if you want to allow Flojo to try to auto scale these parameters. But otherwise, it's as simple as just opening the transformation window once you're in the graph window for each of these parameters and you know toggling those settings to, to get it just right. Okay, so a little tedious on some level, but really makes all the difference for a, a Tisney that's going to look like a big blob or a Tisney that's going to have nice visually separated islands. All right, so if you are interested in the automatic identification of populations, so something that doesn't require manual gates, this is where clustering comes in handy. Okay, so clustering is basically the unsupervised identification of populations right from the high dimensional space. And so here you can see, you know, the power of what these tools can do for us, right? So here is a clustering tool called Phenograph, where the authors have fed this data set into the clustering tool and asked it to just find populations, right? It returned 15 different populations. They don't get names or anything like that, just numbers. So 15 different populations. But when the authors go through um, each of these populations um, and kind of manually annotate them or just do a manual gating analysis on the, the original data, they see that each of these identified clusters um, corresponds to a population that could be found with a manual approach. Okay, so that means that this tool found meaningful populations, right? It's not just finding, um, you know, biological nonsense, right? It is, they are biologically relevant cell types. And it did it in a you know fast, unsupervised way, right? That didn't require a bunch of manual gates. And we can visualize the relationship between these clusters right, by putting them on a dimensionally reduced plot, like in this TISNY, right? So we only get two parameters, TISNY1, TISNY2. And by rendering them all in the same graph, right, we can appreciate that, oh, well, cluster, uh, it's hard to see these colors, but let's say cluster four and cluster uh, two, Right, are, are both um, in the same island, so they must be variants of the same cell type. So all in all, you'll end up with phenotypically similar cell populations within a cluster, and ideally, lots of differences between clusters. So clustering options available in Flojo software are going to be Flosum, XShift, and Phenograph. Um, so you can go into our webinar library or our plugin video demonstration library uh, to learn more about each of these individually. Um, but today we're going to focus on Flowsum um, a little bit because that's going to be the highlight um, in this webinar. So all of these tools are typically published um, or they at least have some kind of a, a GitHub, GitHub documentation library. Um, but uh, Flowsum has definitely been published. So here's the publication in case you would like to learn more about the you know, intricacies of the tool and how it was developed. Um, but I've tried to summarize it here on this slide for you. So how does Flowsum work? What exactly is it doing? So Flowsum, so the SOM in that tool's name uh, basically stands for self-organizing map. And so what that means is that your data will basically be converted into a matrix where we have every cell in a row, every marker in a column. And right? so you have this huge matrix representing your data. And using that data, we start building this um, self-organizing map. Right? So organizing um, similar you know, rows of cells um, towards one another. And so you'll ultimately end up with a ton of nodes, right? You can end up with as many as, as 100 different nodes, 100 different proposed cell types. Then each of those nodes gets connected to build a minimum spanning tree, right? You, you get one kind of in the background calculations, but you also get a visual representation of that as well. So each of these little circles, right, represents a SOM node. Then these little SOM nodes basically get clustered again so that you get meta clusters, which are ultimately the final clusters that will be returned to the workspace. So in this example, I've been given um, 15 meta clusters. And so you can see each of those represented by this background color on this minimum spanning tree here. So what are some great things about Flowsum? Um, it's fast. It's probably one of the fastest clustering tools we have available uh, just because of the, the nature of how the math works. Um, it reproduces prior knowledge really well. So if you have a, you know, a, a gating hierarchy that's pretty straightforward in your data set that you can reproduce um, you know, with some frequency through a manual approach, 
and you have an idea of how many populations are in your data, it can typically reproduce those manual gates pretty well. Um, and it's not going to have too much trouble finding major lineages. You can see it makes some really great visuals, and I think that's why it's such a popular tool among users. You get this minimum spanning tree uh, where you can see inside each of the nodes there's a radial plot, and the height of the kind of the pie slices in that radial plot show the kind of uh, level of expression of a given marker inside that node. You also get a heat map. So you'll have each of your clusters represented, and then you'll have all of your parameters there as well. And there's an option to do a dendrogram to kind of link together um, similar populations or um, groups of markers, right, that are kind of maybe associated with one another. So a lot of visual representation of the, of the output as well, in addition to the clusters that you just get returned back to the workspace. So one consideration with Flowsum is you do have to specify the cluster number. Okay, so it's not 100% unsupervised in the sense that you will have to guide the tool on how many meta clusters to return. There can be some guidance for that, right? We can we can try to go based off the parameter number as a starting point. Like if you have 18 parameters in your panel, um, you'll probably have at least 18 different cell types in there, unless it's some kind of major lineage panel. Um, so that can be a starting point, right? I usually try to guess how many manual defined populations I could find and then just overtune that a bit. So if I know I can find 15, I'll ask Flowsum to return 20, at least as a starting point. Uh, but the good news is, you know, especially with the recent update we've done to the plugin, you can run Flowsum as many times as you'd like and compare the different cluster outputs and, and find the kind of magic number that gives you the separation that you want. So if you, let's say, run Flowsum or any other clustering tool, then perhaps you want to take an opportunity to visualize those populations on a dimensionally reduced plot. Um, and dimensionality reduction is basically a way to get a low dimensional representation of high dimensional data. So your data, again, it's it exists in as many axes as parameters you have in your um, experiment, right? So we tend to think of things in 2D or 3D. Um, but if you have an 18 color panel, it's, your data exists in 18 different dimensions, right? So we can't visualize that on a computer screen, um, but what we can do is compress it into um, a biaxial plot representation and try to have um, events that have a similar expression pattern kind of grouped together on that dimensionally reduced space. Um, let's see, looks like we have something in the chat here. Let me take a peek. Oh, yes, um, that is a good question. So a question in the chat says, um, are you considering introducing the elbow method for initial meta cluster number? Um, oh, like, that's a great question. I don't know if we have plans to incorporate that in the plugin itself, um, but in case anyone is wondering about what the um, elbow method is, it's basically the idea, and it gets described very nicely in the, in the publication if you'd like to learn more. But it's the idea that, um, like, I, like I described in kind of a high level manner, we can run multiple iterations of the clustering and ultimately stop um, at the number where our variance between clusters starts to go down. Um, so if I run 10 clusters, if I run Flowsum and get back 10 clusters, um, and there's a lot of difference between them, that's great. And if I run it and get 12, and there's even more differences between them, even better. If I run 15, and now um, I'm losing some variation, maybe cluster 13 and cluster 14 actually look very similar, and cluster 1 and cluster 2 actually look kind of similar, I've now reached a point um, where the, the graph has kind of like gone past the plateau, and it's it's becoming somewhat detrimental to add more clusters um, because um, they're starting to look the same. Right? Um, so, and you can have it be on the opposite end as well. So if you have too few clusters, um, you're not really capturing the the variance um, between the different populations there. Right? If you if you only have this whole data clustered into two clusters, um, you know it's going to be hard to appreciate that biological variance. Right? So. Um, so to answer your question, no, we don't have it, I think, incorporated in the plugin. That's a great feature request. Um, but you know, you could do uh, a work around in Flojo, or I should say a workflow in Flojo that would involve running Flowsum um, kind of in an iterative manner. So maybe doing like 10, 15, 20 clusters. 
And then we do have a tool called Euclid, um, which I won't have a lot of time to talk about today, but we do have webinars on that topic, which is our clustering quality control tool that helps evaluate if you have a lot of variability between clusters. Um, and that will help you, you know, have a sense of, you know, something has been, you know, under or over clustered. So there's a metric to see if two clusters are very similar. Um, there's also a, a metric to see if two clusters are, are very different. And it's doing this pairwise really for all of your clusters. Um, and basically with the combination of those metrics, you can see if you've over clustered or under clustered the data. Both can sometimes happen. Maybe one cluster didn't get separated out enough. Um, there's some bimodality in there, a bunch of different phenotypes, so we can subcluster that. Or you might have a handful of clusters that got overclustered. Um, they can be merged if they're ultimately the same. So we can do a similar elbow method using tools already available in Flojo, or you could use Flojo for the flow sum clustering, um, and then you know use like Excel plots or something like that to to do the variance calculations. It's a great question though, and it is, it can be a way to help you find that magic number of flow sum clusters um, that you're trying to achieve. So going back to dimensionality reduction, okay, so this is again going to be um, primarily for data visualization, right? So we have a number of these available in Flojo software. Um, I think when I first started um, with the company, we had Tisney, UMAP, and, and maybe embed some, um, but the others, um, TriMap and PacMap and Fate, um, have really just kind of taken off in the past um, couple of years um, and really adding to this repertoire of dimensionality reduction tools that we have available. So TISNI and UMAP are probably um, the most well-known, the most common. Um, TISNI is a very popular choice because it um, was one of the first dimensionality reduction tools that became used in flow cytometry data. Um, but also it flattens the data really nicely, right? We can see the resolution inside of islands very well. And because of that, it's thought to have really good local structure. Right? We can open up islands very nicely and see what's inside them and appreciate the relationship of events within an island. Now, UMAP, on the other hand, um, also gives really nice embeddings, um, but UMAP is more concerned with global structure, so using the space between islands to convey their relationship, right? So if two islands have a lot in common, they'll be in more proximity. If they have less in common, they'll be more distant from each other. Um, but because of that, we do sometimes lose the local structure a bit, right? The islands might be a little more compressed and not as open as we see in a Tisney. But we do get the ability to, you know, interpret relationships based on distance between islands. We can't do that with a Tisney, right? We can't say that these two islands are close together, so they must be related. Um, we can only really concern ourselves with events within an island. And so they each have their place. I think UMAP is great for, you know, like trajectory studies because we can possibly capture cells that are in some kind of a transition between islands. Um, but Tisney is nice because it flattens so well. Um, rare cell types might show a little bit better, might get a little overcrowded in a UMAP. But at the end of the day, they are all visualization tools. You can run multiple and just pick the one that you think makes your data, um, you know, a stronger support of whatever, you know, results you're presenting in your presentation. Um, TriMap and PacMap and FATE are all just new implementations of dimensionality reduction that are really trying to emphasize the global structure that UMAP tries to achieve, right? So you can see looking at these visuals, right, these kind of comets, these peninsulas off the islands are a little bit more pronounced. So, you know, just trying to model the data in different ways. Um, you can see FATE has a, a diffusion pattern. So almost trying to model a cell trajectory, a pseudo time for your cells that might be um, going through some kind of a, an evolutionary pattern in your data. Um, there's also um, TriMap, which to me oh, renders something like a UMAP, but again with more pronounced peninsulas. And then PacMap is supposed to be a kind of a compromise between Tisney and UMAP. So trying to emphasize global structure, but trying to open up the islands a little bit as well. 
Now, embed sim is going to be our spotlight dimensionality reduction tool today. So I'll go ahead and talk about that on the next slide. So what is embed sim actually? Um, so again, a published tool, you can see the publication here at the top of the page. Um, and I think since then there's been an updated publication um, that's more of a code description paper, um, but um, both uh, pieces of literature really nicely break down what you know how this tool is working and, and how it's different from other tools out there. So basically what EmbedSum is trying to do is really just give you the fastest embedding possible. So things like UMAP um, and maybe PacMap and FATE, um, even TISNI on some level, um, they can be a little computationally expensive. Right? If you have a really large data set um, let's say a million cells, for instance, you know, an embedding like that, depending on the amount of RAM you have on your computer, you know, it could take up to an hour or something like that. Um, if you're trying to do millions of events, I mean, that could be hours if it even completes at all. And so, you know, it's not to say that those tools don't render nice embeddings, but they're, they're not always practical for a large volume data set for a typical benchtop computer, right? So the authors of this tool have found a way to kind of speed up those calculations so that we can get uh, embeddings in a fast way. So when the tool was first proposed, it actually would use landmarks that were generated by flowsum clustering. So you would run a flowsum clustering, right, on your data, which when you're doing the flow sum clustering in the background, you're already getting this self-organizing map, right? So you have your data, you run flow sum, which generates this self-organizing map, right? That tries to arrange your um, you know, cells by similarity. And it would basically take that self-organizing map and flatten it out um, so that you could get an embedding that ultimately looks like um, what we see here kind of in the second example at the bottom of the screen. So basically using calculations that already come out of the flowsum clustering to give you, um, you know, an embedding of your data, right, in a low dimensional space without having to basically run the calculations from scratch. Now, since then, there have been updates to the tool where we can not only use flowsum landmarks, we can just have the tool calculate its own self-organizing map. So let's say you didn't run a flowsum clustering tool. Um, you want to use a different clustering tool, but you still like the idea of embed sum. It can just run its own self-organizing map, right? Whether it came from flowsum or uh, just runs it on its own, and then still give you um, an, a fast embedding of your data that might look something like what's here on the bottom left. Last but not least, they have changed it um, once more, or I should say updated it once more, that now we can speed up the calculation even more by doing kind of a generalized TISNI. So basically the tool can take a subset of events from your data. So if you have a million events, it'll subset maybe, let's just say like 100,000 of them and run a real quick TISNI and then project the rest of your data onto that TISNI and do the same thing in a UMAP implementation as well. And that gives you kind of what you're seeing here on this bottom right example, right? So here, this is all the same data, right? Projected in four different ways, either using flowsum landmarks, landmarks for the native embedsum, or landmarks from UMAP and TISNI. Um, so you can see how the results might differ, right? If you use um, SOM landmarks, maybe you don't get as much separation between the islands but each of the islands are very nice and open and you kind of get that you know local resolution if you use the tisney or umap landmarks you might get more distinct islands um, that represent each of your different um, cell types um, depending if you use umap or tisney right you'll have different degrees of global or local structure that gets preserved of the data so why is um you know embed some distinct, how is it different or beneficial from some of the other tools? Um, it's going to be incredibly fast. I think that's what it has going for it the most. It's going to handle large data sets very well. Um, again, if you tried to run a TISNI, a native TISNI or a native UMAP on millions of cells, um, that, you know, that could take hours, if even possible, on your computer. Um, whereas, you know, an embed sum, you know, that might be um, a little bit more attainable. I've never tried it on a super high volume data set. Um, but I think that's where you'll see the main computation time differences between this tool and say something like a TISNI or a UMAP. 
It also gives you an opportunity to forward propagate your data. So if you use FlowSum landmarks, so if you have a FlowSum clustering that you reproduce on data with some frequency, we can actually just use those FlowSum landmarks and generate embeddings of them even on new data sets. So if you come into a new data set that's the same experiment, we can find the FlowSum clusters, forward propagate those, and then project those clusters onto an embedding, right? And we can do that with the same two calculations that we've done on the older data. So you can kind of keep, in a way, copy and pasting um, an analysis um, on new data. So what are some considerations when using the tool? So the SOM landmarks, um, sometimes they can produce crowded embeddings, and we can try to, to attune that a bit in the plugin, and I'll show you that in the demo. Um, but you can see, for instance, if, um, if you're comparing the SOM landmarks to like the UMAP and the TISNI landmarks, um, th there's a little bit of crowding between some of the islands. They may not separate as well as if you use the UMAP or the TISNI landmarks. Um, we can, you know, adjust things like the smoothing and the spacing, um, but you know, ultimately they're they're not always going to be as um, crisp as say uh, the UMAP landmarks or the TISNI landmarks or just a native UMAP and TISNI. Which, you know, speaking of that, when we do the UMAP and the TISNI, you know, we're not needing to set, uh, subset that data when we use the native tool. So if we use the you know, old fashioned or original UMAP and TISNI, you know, it is considering all of the data when it builds these embeddings. Whereas in embed sum, um, really just because it's trying to be fast, it's only considering a subset of the data. Is that impactful for rare cell types? You know, that is something I haven't tested and, and it's something that you can try on your end, um, but it is something to consider, right? It is taking just a random subset of events to render that embedding. Um, but if you have a really robust set of populations that you typically have no trouble finding and visualizing, it's probably not a concern at all. Okay. All right, so after you have, you know, visualized your cell types and, you know, maybe identified some clusters, really the homework comes with trying to find out what those clusters are expressing. So we are going to need an opportunity to phenotype our clusters, see what they're expressing, how they're different from one another. And we can do that in a tool called Cluster Explorer, which is natively integrated in Flojo now, where you can see the frequency of each of your clusters color coded, that color code remains throughout the interface so that you can see the expression of each of the markers in your panel relative to the other clusters. You get that in a heat map form as well, and you get an automatic overlay of a dimensionality um, reduction plot that you have calculated. So in this example, I'm showing you a map, but this could easily be an embed sum embedding as well. And you also can see the difference in the distribution of your conditions or samples or donors across each of the clusters. So it becomes very easy to spot, you know, which samples um, are different in their abundance of some of these clusters. So it looks busy, but the plots are interactive. So you can see in this example, I'm focusing only on cluster 13 and 14. I can see that they're pretty similar, except that one of the clusters has CD4 and um, the other one does not, right? One of them has CD8 and the other does not. Okay, so they're basically a very similar cell type, um, but you know they're just different lineages, right? So they both seem to have um, some TNF, some CD69, so activated T cells, which might explain why they're in some proximity on the UMAP, um, but one's a CD4 and one's a CD8, but otherwise they share a lot of different markers. And I can see that basically both of these clusters are only um, enriched in my samples that have been stimulated. You see, there's a question in the chat. Um, I think, let me scroll down a bit. Um, would you suggest using embed sum during exploratory studies if the rare populations may go down? Um, that's a good um, question, Jacob. So, you know, let me go back to the embed sum slide here. <clears throat> the the subsetting you know, I'm not really sure to what degree that gets done on the data set. I, I do agree that I think if you were concerned about it, um, usually what we recommend to people going down a high parameter pipeline is that it doesn't hurt to do an exploratory analysis to start, right? You don't have to go all in initially um, because these algorithms take time to run and you don't want to get too invested into um 
you know, a, an analysis or a final result if you ultimately decide that you want to change clustering tools or you've come into some, some new data and now you need to rethink some things or you've decided to redesign the panel. So now you need to go back. And so, you know, it, I don't think it hurts to make use of faster tools like embed some to start um, just to quickly see the relationship between clusters that have come out. And you can also, you know, even if you don't want to use something like embed some and you decide you want to use UMAP or, or TISNI, the original implementations, you could speed up the calculations by just really downsampling your data. Um, and again, these are just starting points so that you can quickly navigate between different files in that concatenated or different samples in that concatenated file. Because the more events you have in a concatenated file and in all of these calculations, like e everything's gonna move a little slower. So you can do an exploratory analysis on a subset of your data or use the full data and use something fast like embed some to really just give you um, an idea of like what kinds of phenotypes might be of interest, what kind of cell types are we gonna give our attention to. And then when you're more confident about that, you can go back to the full data set and, and you know really run those tools um, you know, more carefully with more events. Um, and then you already know like, okay, well at that resolution, I'm not going to lose my dendritic cells or, you know, I couldn't see my dendritic cells very well. So now I know when I go back and redo the UMAP, um, the original or the embed some version, um, I really need to, to put more events. Um, so, um, I don't think it's a bad idea to do a first pass of your analysis that's somewhat crude and then to go back and really be more comprehensive about the tools that you choose, how many events you include, even what parameters you include. Because um, you might get to a point where, let's say you're in Cluster Explorer and you see some parameters that don't, you included in your panel, but they really don't add any discriminatory power to the identification of populations. So for instance, I have here IL-8, and this is cut off a bit, but let's just say it's IL-12. Um, that cytokine, it doesn't change at all between any of the clusters. They're all equally not really expressing it. Um, so it doesn't really add any value to me in this panel um, because it's not helping me separate out anything. So maybe after this exploratory analysis, when I go back, I'll just exclude that parameter from the clustering step because it's not giving any new information and it's clouding up the, the separation of these populations. So I don't think it's a bad idea as a short answer. I think it's fine to do a first pass at your analysis. And then um, if you decide you're not getting enough resolution, you can consider a different tool or you can consider adding more events and keeping the same tools, but maybe removing some parameters. So I hope that answers your question. Let's see if there's another one. All right. Uh, let's see what else we've got here. Okay, so I'll start wrapping up these slides here. And then as promised, I'll try to do a quick demo in the software before we dismiss. So we'll, you know, maybe another 20 or 30 minutes, we'll be wrapping up here. Um, so let's say you get to the end of phenotyping your clusters, um, but you're not really sure what to name them, right? At the end of the day, we want to give our clusters some kind of identity so that we can talk about them at conferences or uh, reference them in publications. So there's the typical immunologist approach of, you know, depending what the marker is expressing, we call it a class switch B cell or we call it a resident memory T cell. Um, but it is sometimes hard to get consensus in the field of what those cell types are. And we can only ever say what it's expressing. And so that's what this tool aims to do for us. So it uses marker enrichment modeling to basically give a, a score to each of your clusters that it, reveals what its phenotype is. So the way it typically works is you have all of your clusters and you'll focus on one cluster and it's compared to all the other clusters. And it's basically saying on a scale from, um, you know, negative 10 to positive 10, how much CD5 does cluster one have relative to the others? Okay, well, how much CD8 does it have relative to the others? And it does that for all the clusters until you end up with these strings of scores that basically show you know, what that cluster is expressing. Um, and then you can export these scores outside of Flojo. I know people are working on databases that can, you know, reference this information to help with cluster annotation. Um, but for now, you know, you'd have the score. And then ideally, you would just use that score in a publication and say, 
you know, here's cluster one, which we saw upregulated in this animal group. Here's its MEM score. And then for the rest of the paper, it's just cluster one. But you've already stated what the MEM score is. So, you know, reviewers and audience readers can be aware of what the phenotype is. Um, but you don't have to keep, you know, referencing it. And you don't have to be forced to come up with a name that maybe is going to get disputed anyway in the, in the field. Um, we can also use these scores just as a quality control step. Right? There's also an opportunity to merge clusters that have um, very similar scores. Um, so that can also just be part of the cluster QC process, even if you're not interested in the, in the naming convention. So a great new tool that we've added. Um, last but not least, we also have an opportunity to forward propagate our data. So you know, because we have to concatenate these files, um, if you come into some new data, you know, typically you would have to start over. Right? We'd have to reconcatenate that new data and redo the clustering, redo the dimensionality reduction. But we now actually have an opportunity to forward propagate those calculations through a tool called Embed. So let's say you run um, a UMAP and a phenograph on some data and you've kind of gone, you've done it in a really comprehensive way, right? It's not a, an exploratory analysis at this point. You're, you, you really like the way it's come out. You wanna reproduce those results, but you've come into some new data. We can basically take that new data, look for its nearest neighbors in the old data and project it onto the same UMAP island or assign it to the same cluster that was found right in the old data. So using kind of the old data to you know, establish those landmarks um, that we have in the new data. And so it gives us an opportunity to do that. Now, I will say, if you have an interest in FlowSum and EmbedSum, kind of like I mentioned before, those tools already have their own inherent forward propagation. So while Embed in FlowJo is still an option, you could just use also the native um, kind of forward propagation features that are available in FlowSum and EmbedSum. Because if you recall, when you run your FlowSum clusters, you'll get the SOM nodes, and we can use those nodes to apply them to new data so we get the same clusters. And then we can use those nodes again to get the same embedding in EmbedSum. And so just keep in mind that these are these are different um, tools, different sets of tools, but they're all a means to the same end, right? Which is just forward propagating data um, onto new data or forward propagating calculations onto new data. So we have a native tool in Embed to help with that. But if you're already using FlowSum and EmbedSum in your pipeline, these tools have their own forward propagation abilities as well. Okay, so just to summarize our journey today, right? we talked about pre-processing our files, so the importance of cleanup, um, batch correction if you think you need it, um, and then also um, being able to you know, merge the files together, separate them out with keyword annotations, we can enter a pipeline that could include something like FlowSum for population identification, as well as EmbedSum for dimensionality reduction. And then we have tools like Cluster Explorer and MEM to help us you know, give our clusters some kind of identity and also really understand what they're expressing and how there's differences between our conditions. So we have a lot of plugins available to use in Flojo software. And I have but scratched the surface of what I think are the, the main components of a high parameter workflow. But we have um, a number of others that go beyond a standard workflow. So for instance, we talked about Euclid for quality control of your clusters and making sure that you have um, an adequate number, right? That you haven't under clustered or over clustered your data. We also have things like Hyperfinder, which give us a computational solution to find a gating strategy for a complex phenotype. So if you get interested in a cluster or um, an embed some island that you want to sort, uh, we're sometimes limited by you know, the number of colors we can use on our sorter, the number of gates we can use on our sorter, or needing to exclude intracellular markers because we need to keep the cells alive for whatever reason. So HyperFinder gives you an opportunity to you know, go from you know, the, the computational space, you know, all the way up to, you know, having those cells in your hand in a dish so you can do more, um, you know, direct analysis of it. Okay. So more than likely we have webinars or videos dedicated on each of these tools or topics. Um, but if you don't find what you need, um, you know, you can always um, contact myself and I'm happy to direct you to some learning resources, but just know that our website has um, webinars short video tutorials and documentation pages um, to really help you with all of this. 
So I'm going to move now into the software and I'll try to do a quick demo for us so that we can have you all um, going on with the rest of your day here. So, okay. All right, so here is a workspace that I've gone ahead and done a little bit of prep work on um, just to kind of save us some time um, in today's webinar. So this is an 18 color NK cell panel. So a full panel dedicated just to NK cells. So there's gonna be a lot of combinatorial phenotypes in here, a lot of complex um, gating. So rather than just go down that manual gating approach, you know, I've opted to apply a high parameter workflow here. So I've gone ahead and loaded the data. The data has been compensated during acquisition. Compensation looks good. I ran a cleanup tool. So I ran Peacock on this data to exclude kind of technical anomalies from the data. From that good events, I continued with just a manual gating of removing multiplets, removing debris to focus on lymphocytes, and then gated down to CD3 negative cells. Um, because this is an NK panel, um, this is kind of just my dump gate to uh, make sure I focus only on you know, non-T cells and that we focus only on the um, NK cells for today. So I've done ahead and done all of that homework for us. Okay, I have also gone ahead and opened each of these um, individual files. Now you could do this in the concatenated file as well, but I just want to bring it up here um, just in case I forget to bring it up later, um, which is to make sure you have good visual separation right between each of your markers. Okay, so if you see an area that you think could improve or you could always launch the graph window, right? Maybe minimize some of that white space um, and do something like that if you needed to. Okay. So this one, I probably overshot that a little bit. So I'm going to go back and just go ahead and do it this way. Okay. okay. So again, just, just a matter of going in, making sure you have good visual separation. But again, you could do that um, after the concatenation as well. Okay, so moving on. So the next requirement right before we, we start to merge these files is we want to make sure we're able to separate out each of these individual files after the merger. Okay, so this is where we would use keywords. So in the Flojo tab, there's a keyword button. You can hit that keyword button, which opens up a dialogue, and we can call uh, the keyword something that helps designate our different samples. So maybe in my case, I'll call the keyword donor. And I know that I have, and I'm going to minimize this to make it smaller. So I know I've got one, two, three, four, five different donors here. So I'll just come in and give each of them a unique value to show that they're unique files. Now, for those of you familiar with keywords and keyword values, or you might have used words here in the past, um, which is totally fine if we're trying to just add keywords for the sake of just you know saying what file is what in a typical manual analysis, um, but in the concatenation, we're gonna ultimately gate on that keyword to separate out these files. So this keyword value needs to be a number, right? It needs to be an integer for the sake of the high parameter workflow. And so here, any unique value will be a unique peak right on that graph window. So my donor 20 is gonna have a peak of one, donor 27, peak two. Now I can have another keyword that's like, um, you know, placebo vaccinated or just as um, condition. And maybe all of my samples that were placebo, they'll get a one. All of my samples that were vaccinated, they'll get a two. Okay, so the keyword value kind of denotes, um, you know, the uh, particular variable in your experiment. Okay, so you can have as many keywords as you need, um, but you go ahead and, and be comprehensive about adding them all at this step, because once we concatenate the files, right, we can't go back and add keywords. Okay, so, just, so think about every keyword variable in your experiment that you would want to reflect here um, and be confident about the values. All right, looks like there's something in the chat here. Do you do the data cleanup before concatenation of different files or after? That's a good question, Claire. The cleanup, we would want to do it on the original files um, just because then what could happen is once we concatenate the files, some of the files might have different you know, intensities of a marker. And if we look at that over time, it, it could look like an anomaly, but really it's just that the, the that particular sample had a different um, signal in that moment in time. Um, so 
yeah, typically the cleanup will be done on the individual files. The other reason to do it on the individual files is because some of the cleanup tools will actually use the uncompensated data. Um, so sometimes when we concatenate the file, we're forced to only bring over only the compensated data, in which case we don't have the raw data anymore to go back and run those cleanup tools. So it's going to be ultimately more easy and straightforward and accurate to just run the cleanup tool on the individual files before the concatenation. Okay, so I added any keywords that I thought are going to be necessary, at least for this experiment. So I just have one, but again, add as many as you need. Then we'll select our population for concatenation. So we want to select a cleaned up population. Um, so in my case, the CD3 negative. So I'll select that population. You can right click and use a shortcut to select equivalent nodes. I'm going to select that same CD3 negative population right, for each of the five samples in my workspace. We'll right click and say export concatenate populations. And this is going to open up a dialog. We're going to move to the concatenate portion of the dialog and open up the advanced options. So here's an opportunity to not only normalize the samples, but also downsample. So you can see that I have a different number of CD3 negative events for some of the donors. Some have as little as 50, or I should say 500,000. Some have as little as 100,000. Okay, so that's quite a discrepancy in those two donors. So, you know, I don't want any one donor over influencing the algorithm. Okay, so that's an opportunity to normalize and make sure they're equally represented. But also we can reduce kind of the computational burden of these calculations. Okay, so if I immediately go in kind of guns blazing and, and say, you know, I want 200,000 events from each of these donors, some of which I don't even have 200,000 events, and I have a, a file with 1 million events, um, you know, that's going to be a little, you know, time consuming um, for, for some of these calculations, which is fine if, if you're already at kind of a second pass of your analysis. But for a first pass, you know, it might, it might be a little too much depending on the size of your data. So I'm going to start a little more conservative. I'll say um, 10,000. So I'll say 10,000 events from each of the five, which is going to give me a file that has 50,000 events. Here, you can take an opportunity to name your, your file. Okay, so I could say something like, uh, you know, CD, CD3, right, neg, um, or something like that. Okay, so however you want to name that concatenated file, um, right, however granular you want to get, you can take an opportunity to name it. The parameter selection, most people will be in a position where they can only pick the second option, um, which is brings in only the compensated parameters. If you, uh, and really that's because we can only accommodate one compensation matrix. So um, if you have a longitudinal study, right, where each data set has a different compensation matrix, then you have to pick the second option because we can't accommodate all of that uncompensated data. If your data all came from the same experiment, so it has the same compensation matrix, either acquisition defined or calculated in Flojo, you can pick the first or the second option. Okay, so in my case, I'll pick the first option. Okay. Last but not least, the additional parameter is probably the step I see skipped most often. So because you added this keyword to the Flojo workspace, right, and it wasn't added into the FCS file during acquisition, we need to make sure it gets incorporated into the concatenated file. So what we'll do is we'll say, see how it says no keywords selected? We'll say choose, and we'll make sure that we select any and all keywords that we added at this point in time. Okay, so for mine, it's going to be donor, which means it'll be towards the bottom somewhere. There it is. Okay, so here's my donor keyword. I'll say OK. Um, spread distribution of the keyword data. You can, most of the time, it's OK to turn that off. Uh, really, that just basically, um, instead of, you know, your, your data existing in kind of a straight line, which we'll see in a moment in the graph window, um, you know, sometimes people want to have the, the keyword values like a little more flow data like and kind of, um, you know, spreads them out so they're not all stacked on top of each other. But if you have a lot of samples, it, it can kind of impede their separation. So you can turn it off for the most part. But if for whatever reason you like the, the, the sp spread being introduced, um, you can turn that back on. Okay, so once that's all done, I'll say concatenate. I'm going to go ahead and bring it into an existing workspace. You can choose to bring it into a new one if you feel like the, the last one's getting too big. Okay. Close all of this. Right, and here's my concatenated file. Right, I've got 50,000 events, so 10,000 from each of the five donors. 
I'm actually going to quickly just make a new group um, and I'll call it concat really just so I can uh, make some room for us. This isn't really required. Okay, so I'm going to bring that here. Okay, so here's our concatenated file. All right, it looks like we have some stuff in the chat. Let me take a look. Um, one question, is there a difference of the downsample plugin and downsampling by including no more than, oh, and it looks like someone asked the exact same question. That's really funny. Um, yes, so Jacob and Martin, those are great questions. I get them pretty often. There, There's no difference to my knowledge. I think they're both the same math, right, on how they're subsetting those events. So if you're going to downsample just for the sake of concatenation, I think it's fine to just skip the downsampling plugin. The downsampling plugin um, has other uses outside of preparing for concatenation. So for instance, if you were just doing a manual analysis here and you wanted to normalize these population numbers, so here my CD3 negative for one donor is 129,000, but for another donor it's 500,000, then here would be a good application of the downsample plugin because I can do my analysis on the same number of events for those two populations right, without having to export them out of Flojo. Um, but if you're just preparing to do concatenation, um, rather than do the downsample, then do the concatenation, you can just, like as we saw in that dialogue, right, export concatenate populations, and we go here. Here, we're, we're achieving the same thing, but we just skip a step. So, so yeah, good question, but it's basically doing the same thing. Um, looks like there's a follow-up. Is there a limit of data size that can be handled by one single Flojo workspace? Yeah, that, also a good question. I'm trying to remember what was the last kind of stress test we did on it, but I, it, it was somewhere in the neighborhood of two to four gigabytes of, of you know, file size. So if you load a, a four gig file, I mean, it will load. Will you see some lagging? Possibly depending on a number of things, right? How many parameters are in that file? Um, the amount of RAM on your computer is actually probably the biggest determining factor. Um, you know, if, if you load a four gig file on a computer that has like 128 gigs of RAM, um, you know, you might have some lagging here and there, but it'll otherwise be capable of handling it. Now, if you load a four gig file in a computer that has 16 gigs of RAM, where you're already occupying a quarter of your disk space just to even load the file, let alone do any calculations on it. So I think the RAM on your computer is probably going to be the biggest determining factor. But assuming you have a average or above average computer, um, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of, of two gigs, one to two gigs is probably going to give you a comfortable experience in the Flojo. And we can be strategic about that, right? So for instance, in this example, I concatenated my file and I chose to bring it into the same workspace. I could take it into a new workspace, right? There's no reason to keep it here. I'm doing it just for convenience, but if I'm running out of memory on my computer, I could easily bring this into a new workspace and then just close the one behind it and that'll save some space too. It's all things that we can, we can do to reduce the, the computational burden. All right. So we have our concatenated file, again, 50,000 events. How are we gonna separate the different donors? Well, again, we, we assigned keyword values to be able to do that. So if I launch a graph window on that concatenated file, I can come into one of the parameter dropdowns and select my keyword, which was donor, right? So I have one, two, three, four, five peaks, which each correspond, if I turn this into a histogram, which each correspond to my five different donors here. Okay. So what you may notice here is that uh, if it doesn't really what parameter I put it on, right? This is a very straight line, right? All those events are kind of stacked. Um, if you leave the spread on, the the there'll be kind of a, a little bit of random noise added to each side, and so you'll have a more like round population if if you prefer that. But for this purpose, I think it's perfectly fine to have no spread. Oops, I meant to put that on Instagram. Okay, so once I gate on each of these peaks, we'll have our five respective donors, right, subsetted off this concatenated file. So I could draw them individually, or you could right-click, create gates on peaks, and that kind of quickly gives you um, Flojo's best attempt to draw a range gate on each of those individual peaks. So here I've got my 
um, it starts naming at zero, so population zero through four, but those are my five different donor populations. And you can, of course, come in and, and rename them if you'd like. So um, this is how we're going to be able to tell apart the different donors. And you would do this for all of your keywords. So I, I had a different keyword for like vaccination status, right? I could have two peaks, for instance, my unvaccinated, vaccinated, or placebo vaccinated. And now I'd have all of those files binned into those conditions as well. All right, so let's go ahead and do a flow sum clustering, right? So at the end of the day, I don't wanna do any manual gating here. I just want to quickly see what kind of populations are gonna be inside this experiment. So flow sum plugin available from the flow sum, from the Flojo exchange. So if you go into your plugins drop down, there is a shortcut to get to the Flojo exchange. That's where you can retrieve any of our external plugins, like the ones we talked about in today's presentation. And we had videos on how to install them. Um, and also when you download the tool, it'll come in a zip folder with instructions. So take a peek at that um, and you know, reach out if you have any issues. So I'm gonna launch the Flowsum plugin, which I already have installed here. So there it is, Flowsum. Okay. So this is Flowsum 4.10. Okay. So first decision is which parameters do you wanna include in the clustering? Now, we want to take an opportunity here to exclude anything that doesn't give us discriminatory power. I've already gated for CD3 negative cells, so I, there is no benefit to look for clusters based on CD3 expression because I know that they're all negative for CD3. And the same would be true for any other markers that are going to be expressed at the same level or going to be all negative in my target population here. And we don't want to force cluster separation based on a marker that has no heterogeneity between my different cells. So in my case, it's just CD3, but I could exclude anything else that I had included in my downstream gating, or I should say my upstream gating. Um, we'll come back to apply on map. Okay, so the next big decision is how many meta clusters to have flow some return. Okay, so again, there's things we can do to, to take our best guess. You could start with the number of parameters in your experiment. I know I have 18, so eight, I probably have at least 18 different cell types here. Um, if I were to manually gate this data, you know, how many populations do I think I could find myself just knowing what I know? You know, maybe, you know, just looking at the markers there, I, I could probably comfortably find 10. Okay? So these are just ways we can try to have a starting point. But as we mentioned in the presentation, you can run Flowsum multiple times and try different cluster sizes, use tools like Euclid or do like the elbow method if, if you're more you know, bioinformatics savvy and, and try to find the optimal number. Okay. So I'm gonna start with 20, okay? I'll say 20 different clusters. Um, SOM grid size, this is gonna be basically when you're training that SOM grid, um, you know, how many nodes do you want it to initially find before it starts to do the meta clustering? 10 by 10 typically works well, so that's gonna be 100. So 100 different SOM nodes, which I will ultimately bring into 20 clusters. Now, the more clusters you ask for, you may wanna consider turning up this number, right? So if you're gonna want 50 clusters, but you're only gonna start with 100 SOM nodes, right? That only means that two SOM nodes will, will describe every cluster, right? And so maybe that's not big enough. Maybe you can turn this up to like 15 by 15 or something like that, okay? But I think in most cases, 10 by 10 is probably gonna be fine, but you can try tuning that as well and seeing if it gives you better resolution of your clusters, okay? So if you want more clusters, but you think you're losing resolution, try turning up the SOM grid size. Um, everything else is, is mostly to do with the visuals, okay? So these are all display options, right? Do you want the minimum spanning tree? The radial plots inside the tree, do you want to plot all the markers or is there one specific one you want to focus on? The dendrograms and the heat map, do you want to, to make a dendrogram for just the clusters, just the parameters or both? Node scale defaults to 100%. I usually change it to at least 200 just because I think it looks better. Fixed node size, um, you'll notice in the minimum spanning tree, the size of the node will correspond to its frequency in the sample. But if you just want them all the same size, you can hit that box. Advanced options, color palettes. Uh, Rainbow is my favorite, but there's a number of other choices because if you want something more, a more muted color palette, you can change those too. All right, so I've chosen my parameters, my cluster number. Those are probably the two most important decisions. Right now, I'll say okay. 
And so once this is done computing, I'll basically have my 20 fulsome populations show up beneath my concatenated file node here. And so once I have those flowsome populations, I can then do um, something like a dimensionality reduction and overlay them on top of that just to kind of see their immediate relationship. So you can immediately proceed to something like a TISNI or a UMAP. Or what we're going to do today is we're going to use embed some. So we'll talk about that in a second. Right. So here's what the plugin returns. Right. It's pretty quick. You can see how fast it was. So here's my 20 populations just numbered, okay, they don't have any kind of identity. And then um, they automatically in our newest version of Flowsum get kind of um, added to their own Flowsum node. So that Flowsum node is still under my concatenated file, um, but it's nice to have them in their own node because um, then when you run Flowsum multiple times, it's gonna be easy to tell the runs apart. Now there's my Flowsum uh, clusters. Now, the other good thing about Flowsum is again, all the great visuals you get from it. So when you run a plugin in Flojo, you'll get an output folder that'll have the same name as the workspace. And it'll be just beside that workspace, right? In your file explorer. So I'm gonna navigate to mine so I can show you. Um, but in there, you'll have all of the calculations from the plugin, but you'll also get the Flojo outputs for the Flowsum visuals. Okay, so let me navigate to where I have that output folder. Okay, so here's the name of my workspace, NK Panel HD Analysis. Okay, notice how there's an output folder with the same name. So if I open that, I have a Flowsum output folder. I'm gonna open that up, right? Go to the run ID that I just ran, which is this RLKG. And so if you wanna see the minimum spanning tree, you'll see you'll look for the output that has MST in the name. Okay, so if I launch that PDF, right, there's the minimum spanning tree. Okay, I've got 20 different meta clusters, right? Here they are on the minimum spanning tree, the radial plot, right, for each of the nodes inside the minimum tree there. Um, and then you can see that the node size is variable, right? It kind of corresponds to the, how many cells are inside that, or represent that SOM node. Okay, so I have this uh, meta cluster, which is, looks like maybe six or seven, which looks like a pretty dominant cluster. But I also have more minor ones, like this really cyan blue one, cluster 11. Okay. And if you zoom in to the visual, let's see if I can do that quickly. All right, you can see the, the radial graph, right? The height of each of those pie slices and how they correspond to the legend. So more markers you have, the harder it is maybe to appreciate the legend. So maybe consider running it again and excluding some. So there's the minimum spanning tree. You also get the heat map. Let's see if I can remember which one. I think it's this one, cluster heat map. Okay, so there's the heat map representation. So I chose both dendrogram options. So I have not only the, um, there's the, the nodes, all of the SOM nodes. So again, I did 10 by 10, so I'll have a hundred of these. So 100 SOM nodes, there's all of the parameters and dendrogram showing, you know, kind of clustering together the markers that were similar or the uh, parameters that were similar. So that's the SOM node heat map. You also get one for the uh, clusters themselves. There it is. So here's, I've got the 20 different clusters and then there's the parameters. Okay, and then there's the dendrogram groupings. So I can see which clusters already have some things in common okay, based on their marker expression profile. So a lot of great visuals there, give it to you in a variety of formats, PDF, PNG. Um, you also get the raw values in CSV files as well. So flexibility, depending what you want to do with those output images. So other thing about Flowsum is, again, its ability to be forward propagated onto other files, right? So let's say, for instance, when we look at that Flowsum minimum spanning tree, right, we're only looking at the concatenated file. But what if I want to see that tree broken apart by sample, right? I want to see donor 20 as a minimum spanning tree, donor 27 as a minimum spanning tree. Well, what we could do is, you know, we could you know, forward propagate it onto um, these subpopulations, or we could go back to the original file, which has the full event number, right? Select that population, go to the Flowsum plugin again. And this time, this is where the apply on map comes in handy, right? So rather than run Flowsum again on the original file, right? If all I really want is the minimum spanning tree and I want the clusters found, but with all of the events this time, 
Um, and this could even be a brand new file. It doesn't have to be a file that made up the concatenated file. But let's just say this is a brand new sample, a brand new donor that I managed to get access to after I'd already done my analysis. Well, now I could say that I want this sample to be applied on the flow sum map that I just calculated. Okay, so this was the RLKG output. So I want this sample projected on this previously calculated flow sum map. Okay, so I'll go ahead and leave all the display options the same, but I'll say okay. And what I'll get is I'll get all of those same flow sum populations that were found in the concatenated file originally. And I'll get outputs for that file, uh, the new file, including a minimum spanning tree, right, that only represents that new data. And so we get an opportunity to, to incorporate new data and basically just kind of copy paste um, a previous flow sum analysis, right? So there's all the same clusters, right? And cluster 20 will be the same as cluster 20 in the old data. And then if I go to the output folder again, there's the one, there's the apply on map subfolder there. Now I can get a minimum spanning tree, but this time only focusing on that one new sample. And I can already spot some difference, right? That major green cluster that was more dominant in all the files. Well, in this particular file, it's those nodes are much smaller, right? So this some, for whatever reason, whatever cluster number eight or nine is, um, isn't as well represented in this individual file. Okay, so you could break apart each of your minimum spanning trees by sample or um, incorporate new samples um, and, and get a new minimum spanning tree. Okay, it's a lot of power and flexibility with uh, FlowSum there. Okay. All right, so we've got our clusters. So let's go back to our concatenated file. Let's say we wanna visualize those clusters on a dimensionally reduced space. Well, we could use something like EmbedSum to do that. And I'll show you two implementations of, of uh, EmbedSum. Okay, one would be to embed the FlowSum clusters. Okay, so let's select our concatenated file, go to the EmbedSum plugin. Okay, EmbedSum will ask, you know, which parameters do you want to include, right? You only have to answer that if you're going to use any of the other uh, landmark options, because notice if I pick the FlowSum map option, it's going to gray those out because it's not running this calculation anew. It's just going to use a previous SOM training and, and build the embedding from that. Okay, so you don't even have to pick the parameters because you've already picked the flow sum map. What you do have to do, so here, landmark layout, I want to use a SOM that was made from flow sum clusters I'd already calculated. Well, which flow sum do we use? There's a select flow sum map file. You can select that button and you'll have to navigate to that, that R file. Okay, so I'll go into my output folder that we talked about, my flow sum output folder. I will pick that same run, right, the RLKG run. I have a lot of runs here because I've been working with this workspace a lot, but it, you won't have as many to choose from if you've only run it once or twice. Right, there's the file it needs, right? It needs the R data from the FlowSum run, so it can it can retrieve those SOM nodes. Okay, so once I pick that, there's a bunch of different options here to help with the, the image rendering. Okay, you can try to smooth out the islands, adjust the space between them, okay, but you could run a first pass and rerun it if you're unhappy with the image that comes out. Seed is just if you want to try to reproduce a similar embedding um, moving forward, you can try to set that seed value so that um, you, you can kind of reproduce the same starting point. Otherwise, it's just random. Okay, so we'll say select that. Go ahead and say OK. And so once it's done, it's basically going to do an embedding of those flow sum nodes. Okay, so then what we can do is, and we'll look at how it performed, right? We'll bring in this embedded. Right here's the embed sum, two parameters, embed sum one, embed sum two. You can see those calculations in my workspace there. So I'm gonna drag in this concatenated file and let's make it a little bit bigger so we can see. There we go. Okay. So here's my embedding. Okay, so these are all of my events right in a single low dimensional space. I'm going to take my flow sum clusters. These are my 20 flow sum clusters that were identified in my data and also considered in the rendering of this embedding. So let's see how it did. Let's do an overlay. And you know, it did as probably as I would expect, right? Some of the more major clusters are pretty separated out from the rest of the embedding, right? So this yellow, green, purple clusters that are, you know, pretty large and dominant 
are, are separated away. And then maybe I have a little bit of overcrowding for some of the more rare clusters. Right? So we could we could do things like adjust the smoothing um, and the, the K value, right? If we really want to tune that image. Now, another option is to run it again, but this time, instead of considering the flow sum clusters, right? I'm just going to let it run its own new calculation. So I'll exclude CD3 because again, it gives no discriminatory power, right? I already know that all these cells are CD3 negative. And I'm going to pick the TISNY landmark implementation, um, which I find is the fastest landmark calculation. So if you really like the speed of embed sum, I think the SOM embeddings are, are a good high level view of your data and they give nice local structure to the islands. But the TISNY landmark calculation is, is just faster. Okay, so it's gonna subset the data, run kind of a baby TISNY, and then project the rest of the data onto that TISNY. Okay, so in this case, I do have to pick parameters because it's not using the previously established SOM nodes. I'll pick TISNY, again, a bunch of different tunables here you can do for, for the image size. Okay. Uh, map size, okay, if you hover over that, um, how, you know, how many landmarks to use, right? Um, we set it at a default of 5,000, right? Maybe if you turn, turn up that number, you can try to get more, more islands. Okay. Right, so we'll say okay, right? And we'll see how much faster this is compared to the flow sum nodes, which I think it is faster. Minimize these flow sum clusters here. There it is. Okay. So it already finished. Okay. So here's embed sum, but now using TISNY landmarks. Okay. So instead of using the SOM landmarks, again, it runs a TISNY on a subset of the data, projects the rest. Let's see how it did. Right. So let's go ahead and bring in that concatenated file. Zoom in a bit and let's bring in those clusters again. Overlay those. All right. So how did this one do? Well, Let's look at them. So here's the embed sum based on the flow sum landmarks. Here's the embed sum on the TISNY landmarks, right? And I think it speaks for itself in that I definitely get more distinct separation, right? Using the TISNY landmarks. Um, still some room for improvement, right? I do have a little bit of crowding on some of these islands. So maybe I need to adjust some of those smoothing parameters or the K value, things like that. Um, or it's possible I overclustered my data and some of these clusters don't actually really have that much um, separation between them. And that's why they ended up in the same island. Okay. So again, quick, fast way to get an embedding of your data. Um, and again, because we can use the flow sum nodes um, to render these embeddings, right, you could just kind of keep forward propagating the flow sum nodes and the embed sum visual onto to new data. Because if I wanted to repeat this workflow again on a new sample, like I did with the flow sum uh, populations, right, I could do that here as well. Right? I could select that sample, go into plugins, embed sum, and then choose the flow sum landmarks and then pick that same kind of canonical flow sum map file that we're using to define our study. All right, so last but not least, I'll quickly show you how you can visualize your clusters. Okay, so we it's nice to have this dimensionally reduced plot to visualize them, but if you quickly want to just phenotype your clusters, um, you can you know launch off your concatenated file, use Cluster Explorer, which is natively integrated in Flojo. Okay, select your clustering output, you know, which dimensionally reduced plot do you want to bring in, right? Which parameters do you want to visualize? Say accept, and then it's going to go ahead and launch this interactive module, right, where you have everything you need to start digging into these clusters. You've got frequency of the clusters color coded, their relative expression of each of the markers in the panel, same in the heat map view. You get your dimensionally reduced plots, so both of my embed sums with the flow sum landmarks, with the TISNY landmarks. You can focus in on any cluster by clicking it. So here we're focusing on one cluster. I can focus on another, on another. I can focus on two at once. Okay, and that same cluster will be the focal point in the rest of the interface. You can ask specific questions. I want to find all of my CD56 DIM clusters, and I want them all to have um, CD27, 
right? Oh, there's all, there's my two candidates right there. So cluster three, cluster four, in close proximity in the dimensionally reduced space, virtually the same, it seems, except for maybe the CD16 expression, right? One has CD16 high, the other one does not. If you want to explore differences between your donors, you can go to options, add nodes as columns, and let's bring in those five donor populations from my hierarchy. Right now I can see which donors are enriched in particular clusters, right? So it looks like cluster number 11 is really enriched in this last donor population. Well, what is cluster 11? Well, it's it looks like it's got some CD94, some CD226, a um, little bit of a KIR expression. Okay, so that's some kind of a unique, um, maybe inhibitory expressing NK cell in that particular donor. All right, I've got another donor here um, that has a really high frequency of cluster number four. What is cluster number four? Okay, it doesn't express a whole lot other than some CD27, maybe some CD16. Okay. I've got this really abundant cluster number six. What's that? Um, looks to be like something like an immature NK cell, right? It doesn't really express much of anything. Okay, so you can start asking more direct questions um, and really start to explore that data um, and, and, and look for trends. All right, I think I might have something in the Q&A. Let's take a look here. Okay, so there's, looks like there's two questions here. If I understand correctly, you mentioned that we need to concatenate the files at the beginning. However, what happens when you want to analyze different tissues? For example, if you have sample one from liver one, sample two from liver two, sample three from liver three, four, kidney one, sample five. Okay. How do you work with these data sets? So that's a good question. I mean, that is a complex, you know, experimental setup. So if you have different tissues, you certainly could concatenate them into one file, right? One problem that I've run into in the past with trying to analyze data sets from different tissues in the same um, concatenated file is sometimes the expression patterns can be um, a little problematic. So for instance, if I'm looking at CD3 um, on spleen versus gut, maybe in all my spleen samples, the CD3 was a little higher. And so now I'm finding all these CD3 high populations in the spleen. Um, but there's nothing really unique about them. It's just that the CD3 was a little higher than in the gut. And so the clustering tools think that it's a novel population, but it's really, it, it it's just an artifact of the staining. So you may run into situations like that. You're, in, in that case, you could consider doing something like a normalization um, of those data sets if you'd like. Um, but it, it definitely, it can, it can introduce some, you know, problematic workflows. You know, the other option could be that you analyze those data sets separately um, and, and then just look for consensus between them. Like, okay, well, I, I see this type of phenotype in my liver samples. Um, if I do the analysis separately in the um, kidney, do I see the same trends? Do I see the same kinds of activated cell types coming up? Um, so that's another approach. So one approach would be to just you know, take a first pass at it, put them together, see if you're getting a lot of noise. If you're not, it's probably fine. If you are, then maybe consider separate, uh, separating them out into different analyses um, and just seeing if you can find the same consensus results, right? Because at the end of the day, what we'll probably report is a key finding of a, of a particular cell type. And we're not trying to achieve like a global view like I showed in the presentation, right? There's usually little reason to do something like this, where you have to phenotype every single cell that's in that data set, usually we just want to look for differences between samples, and then we focus on the differences and kind of just ignore everything else. Right? So uh, up to you and, and what your end game is for your data. Right? If it's just to find differences, then I would just you know think, consider analyzing them separately, look for consensus. Right? If it's very important to annotate every cell type in that data, um, we can try to find ways to make it work so that we minimize having to duplicate work and just have them all in the same file. Okay. Um, there was another question of how do I process information samples for different conditions? Um, Maria, I'm not sure if I understand your question, but um, if your question is about, um, you know, how do I find differences between the samples? Here's one way that I've shown, right? We can use Cluster Explorer 
and we can add these columns to be able to appreciate differences in the clusters between each of our files. We can also change the node in Cluster Explorer. So here we're looking at the bulk concatenated file, but I could change this to donor number four. And now I'm only focusing on donor number four and I can see the frequency of clusters in that donor, the frequency of clusters in this donor, right? So the phenotype of the clusters won't change. It's just the frequency, right? But you can easily see that every donor has a different frequency of some of these clusters. Now, if you want something more visual, you could also in the layout editor, let me go back here. Oops, layout editor, here we go. Um, oh, we cancel this, there we go. Um, in the layout editor, we can also break apart our, our embedding by donor, right? So here, when we were doing these overlays, we were only focusing on all the donors, right? But I could just bring in, if I'm interested in, you know, let's say I want to compare donor zero and donor two, I could bring them into the layout editor, right? Change their, uh, let me change these to the Tisney ones. Right, change these to the Tisneys. And now I have Tisneys broken apart by donor. So it's pretty easy to see that right in donor two, whatever this island of cells is, is, is pretty much missing and donor zero has more of them. Okay, you can also do an overlay where I take donor zero and donor two, put them on top of each other, right? And now it's color coded. So I can see, oh, you know, everything where there's blue, those are cells that are unique to donor two. And everything that's red, those are cells unique to donor zero. Okay. So we can always um, use visuals like this to help us tease apart differences. But I think, um, you know, the visuals are great, but ultimately if you want stats, um, Cluster Explorer can help with that because we can see, you know, from a percentage point of view, which clusters are more enriched in certain samples. Um, and you can also, if you say options or edit, copy content, we can export all of these MFI values and these percentages. You can also get these percentages from the control panel here as well. Okay, so if you come here and change it to your different donors, we can say, uh, oh, say I've done. Okay, you can say things like options or is it file, edit? I always forget, edit, copy content, and that'll give you these frequencies. Okay. So we have a lot of high parameter workflow webinars that probably go through this in more detail. Um, you know, Because we had so many questions, which I'm always happy to answer, we we're running a little short on time today. Um, but you, you know, we can always uh, visit those webinars to uh, you know, get more insight about these workflows. But to answer your question, overlays, things like Cluster Explorer, those are gonna be our best chance at, at finding comparisons between samples. Okay, uh, let's see, somebody asked, uh, I joined late, can we get the recording? Absolutely, so I think this is gonna be a great stopping point for us as well. So for anyone who joined late, or if you had to leave early um, and you wanna revisit this content, if you go to flojo.com, go to learn, webinars, okay, this is where you might've seen the webinar that you're attending at this moment, which is um, high parameter workflow with Embedsum and Flowsum. You can see our upcoming webinars, but what you're really going to want is the recorded webinars button that's at the bottom. When you hit that button, it's going to bring you to our library. The webinar for today's session, you'll see it right here. Um, they're here in chronological order, so we'll have the most recent one here at the top. Um, and then you'll have all of our other webinars, everything from Intro to Flojo. I'd recommend this phenotyping one if you want to learn more about Cluster Explorer or MEM scoring, you know, things that help us annotate our clusters. This is going to be a good one to watch. Um, and we have other tools as well to speed up a high dimensional workflow, MEM and Embed. We talked about it a little bit, but if you want to learn more, there's a whole webinar on just those as well. Okay. So I highly recommend visiting those. Let me take a look at the Q&A again. I think I've answered everything. All right, so I'll pause here perhaps and see if there are any questions. I'll go ahead and while I wait to see if there's any last minute questions, I'll go ahead and put up my email here.